it seems as though a large part of our time on this earth is taken up acquiring things that we think we cannot live without. Anybody have that problem? It seems like we all don't. It sometimes starts out innocently enough. A car to get to work with, a home, a washer and a dryer. Then we start adding on television, uh, computers, cell phones, digital cameras, electronic games, a boat, and on and on it goes. Our lives are either taken up with work to live this better life, or by making sure we spend every moment playing with the toys we've accumulated. A lot of times our possessions take up so much time we have little left to give to our families. This isn't in here, but I gotta share this with you. I'm gonna tell a story on myself, okay? I usually can't get by without telling at least one story. So I was a new Christian, oh, Seventh-day Adventist Christian back in Maine. This is back in 1976, I think it was, somewhere in there. And I was watching the TV program because it talks about not having time for our families and it registered with me. Maybe this would be something to share. But I was sitting there, I was, I don't know, I don't see the ladies having much trouble with this, but it seems like television kind of sucks us guys in. And we just, you know, every, everything around, we gotta, we gotta be right there. You, you probably don't have that trouble, Jim, do you? No, no, okay. So it's just probably me. So an, anyway, I'm watching this program and the kids are over here playing, making a lot of noise. And the next thing I hear this boy, hey, knock it off. Where did that come from? And I realized that was me jumping on my poor kids there. They were just playing a little noisy. My kids are noisy. But I jumped on them. What do you think I did after that? I threw that TV out. Yes, I did. I got rid of it. I said anything that comes between me and the we only have these little ones for a short time, my folks, and they're growing and gone. If anything comes between me and those kids, it's got to get out of here. And that's when it talks about we have little left to give to our families. Folks, those of you that have young ones, if you've got something that's taking up your time or sucking you in, get rid of it. Tend spend time with those kids, okay? My daughter, number two daughter, I have to count them because I got six kids. My number two daughter went through withdrawal symptoms for about three or four weeks after that television was gone. She didn't know how to play. But we had fun after that. We were out in the snow, we, we had a great time. Spend time with your kids. Enough preaching, now I'm gonna go back to the sermon. God knows the desires of our hearts, and he will help us even in achieving some of those desires while here on this old planet. He doesn't want us to get too attached to these temporary things here, though. That's why he's told in his word, in his words of some of the special things that he is preparing for us, things that won't be destroyed by rust or moth, things that won't be stolen by thieves or damaged by the elements. Today we will be looking at the Lord's preparation for you and I. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for your plans for us. And we'd ask that you would be with us this morning as we review these wonderful things that you have in store for us. In Jesus' name, amen. How many of you enjoyed the sermon last Sabbath that we're here? Wasn't that great? What a dynamic speaker he was. Man, I was, did anybody sleep? I don't think, I didn't sleep. I didn't see anybody nodding off there. So 
he, what did he hit on, really? He was encouraging the young people about another place that's better than what we have here. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. He didn't get into it too much. He didn't do much description. We're going to go back and review. We all know this. Some of the young ones might not, and that's why I'm sharing. There may be somebody here that's visiting today that hasn't read these things. So we're going to go. Take notes if you got time, because there's some good scriptures you probably should go back and read later. First of all, let's open up your Bibles to Isaiah. 64, and we're going to be looking at verse 4, Isaiah 64, verse 4. I still hear the pages turning, I'll give you a few more moments. Isaiah 64 and verse 4. For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard nor perceived by the ear, neither had the eye seen, O God, beside thee, what he hath preferred, prepared for him that waiteth for him. The prophet here declares that since the beginning of the world, men have neither heard nor seen the fullness of God's plan. The declaration is clear. Men once did see, hear, and know of the wonderful things God has prepared for his people. In fact, that plan was revealed to Adam and Eve in all of its glory. God wanted the earth to be like Eden, the garden of the Lord. He gave four tremendous gifts to our first parents. Life, a righteous character, a beautiful home, and dominion over the earth. They could have possessed these gifts forever simply by choosing to obey God in the matter of that one forbidden tree. Through obedience to his will, God intended to make the human family ideally and eternally happy. Angels must have wept when they saw sin come into the human family for the first time. Immediately, all of those original provisions began to be withdrawn. Adam and Eve began to die according to the pronouncement of God. Their dominion passed for the time into the hands of Satan. The image of righteousness was marred within them, and they were driven out of the garden home. The entrance of sin and the story of the fall of man is graphically told in Genesis verses one, chapters 1, 2, and 3. But the nice part is we can go back to the last three chapters of the Bible and we'll see the exit of sin and Satan and the removal of the curse that is depicted. And that's in Revelation Verses of chapter 20 to 22. Now let me assure you, the home of the righteous is going to be right here on this earth. Jesus tells us in Matthew 5, 5, in giving his beatitudes, he said, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. <clears throat> Mark it down well, God's people will finally dwell in this beautiful world, not as it is today. I'm getting kind of tired of what I see going on, folks, and I'm sure you are too. It's not too, too good. But it will be as it shall be prepared for the saints. I always like that word, the saints. Have you ever considered yourself as a saint? The first time I heard a pastor and he did that every time. Oh, he get up, good morning, saints. I said, oh, really? You haven't really looked at my life too closely, have you? But we are, we're saints. That's a gift that the Lord's given us. Saints, amazing. Surely no one would want the earth in its present condition because it's quite a mess right now. We can thank the Lord that when he gives it back to us, it will be altogether different 
from what we see around us today. Uh, Isaiah 65, 17 says, Before, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth. Well, that's an Old Testament account. What about the New Testament? Well, it says Revelation 21, 1, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Again, Old Testament and New Testament. This old blood-soaked world of ours will be replaced completely and all trace of sin will be removed forever. All traces. No more weeds to pick out of the garden. Wouldn't that be fun? Wow, what will we do with all of our spare time? 2 Peter 3.13 Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. That is the kind of world I would like to have, a world in which righteousness dwells. God is going to have a pure, clean planet again. Listen, if a man should neglect to take the opportunity to live there, he will commit the most colossal blunder of his life. That is the most tragic mistake anyone could ever make. May God help us to make that home a glorious assurance without fail. It is shocking how many weak and twisted concepts of heaven people have accepted. Have you talked to folks out there in their description or what their idea of heaven is like? Most folks think of it as some far off celestial place that is about all the average man knows about heaven. He believes it's up there somewhere. Yes, it is up there, and we can agree with him that far, for when Jesus went away, he went up, Acts 1 9 says. And then he said, I go to prepare a place for you. Let's look at that again one more time. John 14. I, I just love this text. John 14, verses 1 to 3. That was our text for today. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Is anybody here troubled today? Accept God. He's our only answer. Believe in God and believe... And then always like this, people are, I've asked people, what's bigger, a house or a mansion? Well, it depends whose house we're talking about. It says in God's house, whose house? God's house are many mansions. Really? That's a big house. He's got all them mansions in there. But all we got to do is go out at night and look up at the stars. This is God's house. The whole universe is God's house, isn't it? Wow. Many men, if it were not so, Jesus said, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. Now, now think about that a little bit. Go to prepare a place. Jim, does, do you think he knows what you like? Oh, yeah. He knows what each one of us like. We're going to have things. We're not going to miss anything here, believe me, folks. Nothing is going to be missed. He's got it all together. He knows what we like, okay? It's a real place. There's mansions there. And it says, what does it say? If I go and prepare a place for you, he's preparing it. He says, well, I'm going to come back, though. I'm, I'm, I'm fixing this all up for you, but I'm coming back because I want you. Lamont, I want you there with me. Okay? And it wouldn't be the same without you. Rose, you too. I want you there. I will come again and I will receive you unto myself. And where I am, oh, where I am, there ye may be also. I want to be with Jesus. Oh, boy. Let's get it done, folks, and go home. The righteous will not sit on clouds out there in space playing harps and singing hallelujah choruses all during eternity. This is a very false and unbiblical picture of heaven. Have you heard people still talk about that? I don't want to go to heaven. Who wants to sit on a cloud and play a harp? You know? Well, I, I wouldn't do very good at that right now because I've never played a harp. 
I can do my little right hand on the piano a little bit because I had lessons when I was very young. But I don't think I would do good. Oh, a few, the only reason a few people do not want to go to heaven is that they don't know what it will be like. You may find a person now and then who will tell you plainly, he doesn't care to go to heaven. But that is only because he has a misconception about it. Popular myths have made heaven seem dull and uninteresting. That's why I'm up here today talking. We're going to bring it to you alive. It's just something to look forward to, folks. The truth about heaven makes it one of the most exciting places imaginable. Forget Disneyland, okay? We're, we're talking way beyond that. The capital city of that future glory land is called the New Jerusalem, and it is currently under construction according to the testimony of Jesus and Paul. It will cover an area about the size of the state of Oregon. If you find that unbelievable, don't take my word for it. Here it is in the Bible, write this now, Hebrews 11 and verse 16. But now they desire a better country. That is a heavenly, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. Where is it being made? Revelation 21, 2. And I, John, saw the holy city coming down from God out of heaven. It's being put together up there. You're not hired on this job, but we got another job for you later we're going to talk about, Jim. <laughs> In paradise at this moment, far above the stars and planets, God is preparing mansions for you and for me. Someday that gleaming white city will descend right down to the earth and settle here as the eternal home of the righteous. How big will it be on completion? Oh, you all know how big it is, but I'm going to tell you anyway. And the city lieth four square, Revelation 21, 16. And he measured the city with the reed 12,000 furlongs. You will notice that the city is perfectly square and the circumference is 12,000 furlongs or 1,500 miles round, okay? That means the city is 375 miles on each side. Now think about it. This is a city, 375 miles on each side. Believe it or not, you could place 450 New York cities inside of those gigantic walls. And, I'm, it, and it's not only square, it's cubed. And that's something I can't fathom, something 375 miles this way, this way, this, and then 375 miles high? Is there any building that we have as 300? That's clear out in the atmosphere, out of the atmosphere, isn't it? That's going to be some building to see, isn't it? Some city. Wow, the things that he's, oh, I can't imagine. The streets are pure gold. The gates of it are solid per pearl, not merely composed of pearls, but actually made of one solid pearl. That's a big pearl. If you want to read the description of this city, this afternoon, pick your Bibles up. Read Revelation 21, verses 10 to 27. We will not only have a mansion in this great city, but we'll have a country estate also. Oh, here we go, Jim. You get to build. And, and you, you have new needs now, too, okay? Isaiah 65, verse 21 and 22. They shall build houses and inhabit them. And they shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of a tree are the days of my people. Have you been to, what is that, over in the coast in California, some of those redwoods? Some of them suckers are pretty old. But eternity is longer than that. 
For the days of the tree are the days of my people, and my elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. Now, I don't know about you, Jim. You had to do that for a living, but when I do construction and stuff, it was, uh, what do you call it? Uh, Labor of love. Okay, I like that. It was a hobby for me. And my wife, I would have people coming to our place up there in, where we lived out in the country in, in Washington State. And they'd say, well, how many people live here? I see all these buildings. And I said, I just have fun building buildings. I had more outbuildings than Carter had probably liver pills. I don't know. So my wife said, what, another one? Well... You never know, I gotta have a place for this and a place for, oh boy, how much fun that was. But not only will we have this country place, we'll have bodies of flesh and bone. Two texts will prove this point beyond question. Philippians 3, verse 21, who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body? We will have bodies just like Jesus had after he was resurrected. Jesus in Luke 24, verse 39, explained to his disciples all about that body. He said, behold my hands, my feet, that it is I myself, handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as you see me have. His resurrected body, we're gonna have one like, it's not going to be one of these old cripple bodies like we got now as we get younger in our age. Somebody may say, well, I don't know how to build. I don't think I want to build houses. As for your knowledge of how to build, don't worry about it for a moment. There will be no limit to what you can learn. We have eternity, folks. Some may say, well, uh, let me back up. As for your knowledge how to build, don't worry about it. You will have a lot, a whole eternity before you learn and understand. You can learn architecture, you can learn about nature, or maybe you want to study astronomy. Sometimes when we look up into the heaven and see a little yellow star glimmering in the southwest sky, we say, my, I wonder what that little star is way up there. Listen, someday we won't need to wonder. We can just say, I think I'll go up there and find out. Then we can go visit that star. That is what the new earth will be like. We can travel with the speed of light, 186,000 186, miles per second, something like that, if I remember my, all of that stuff from way back when. Angels can do it now. Daniel started praying one day before he entered his prayer, an angel had come all the way from heaven to his side. The angel said, Daniel, when you started to pray, God sent me from his throne. And now I'm here in answer to your prayer. How long was that prayer? It was several verses. But he had to be moving out, didn't he? To get Zoom. I mean, he was here. We will be able to travel like that. Huh? Are you getting excited? <laughs> I want to do that. No airplanes. No, no fights on the airplanes. Like we, we don't have to do that. We're gonna, we're gone. Okay. What about animals in heaven? The Bible has a surprising number of reference to this question. Pet lovers will have a field day there. Isaiah 11, verses six through nine. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf, and the young lion, and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them, and the cow and the bear shall feed. Their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox, and the suckling child shall play on the hole of the asp. Oh, it sounds like we still may have snakes, huh? That wasn't, that don't make me too happy. Well, maybe they're nice. Maybe they got fur or something. Maybe they're cute little rascals. Who knows? And the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in my holy mountain. 
It will be a different world. The birds and animals will not fear each other, nor will they any longer fear man. Man will no longer be fearful of the animals, nor will he fear his fellow man. For the first time since Eden, men will be able to trust other men. No one will be there who could inflict harm or unhappiness, put harm and happiness on any creature. Another wonderful feature of this new world would be the absence of sickness and death. There will be no need of doctors, nurses, morticians, or insurance agents. The very issues which cause the greatest grief now will not even exist in the minds of the saints. They will forget eternally the troubles of this life. The little feed, get a little feedback there, get a little ringing, James. One of the greatest promises in the Bible is found in Revelation 21, verses 3 and 4. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God was with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed, passed away. Isn't that wonderful? I tell you, if heaven were no more than those two verses, I'd want to be there, wouldn't you? No more cause for sorrow, no pain, no death, no separation, no more surgeries. You know, we have several here that have been through some surgeries. Isn't that wonderful? I tell you, if heaven were no more, I, I just can't, I get it. I can't wait. We need to get there soon. Isaiah 33, 24, and the habitant shall not say, I am sick. So we don't need to go around when we're in heaven and the nearest, well, how are you feeling today? <laughs> What do you mean, how am I feeling today? We're all going to be young. Wow, I'm looking forward to that. Young and healthy again. No sickness. We're not, we'll, they're going to feel perfect. The immortal bloom of youth will be upon every face. No one will say I'm sick. No one will feel the desperation of seeing loved ones suffer and then slip over to the brink into death. The Bible says children will be there. It says they're going to play in the streets, never get hurt. Zechariah 8, 5. And the streets of the city shall be full of boys and girls playing in the streets thereof. There will be no fear that your child is not safe on this new earth. No hit and run drivers. No falling in a river or a lake and drowning. No school shootings. It's so sad the scenes we're seeing going on in this planet right now. Children are going to grow up there. The Bible says they will grow up as calves in the stall. And I think we adults are going to be doing some growing up also. We will be growing up spiritually and intellectually. All defects will be left behind when we go there. We have a beautiful promise in Isaiah 35, verses 5 and 6. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as a heart and the tongue of the dumb sing, for in the wilderness shall waters break out and streams in the desert. I, I have a few of you that I text every day with my devotional, and uh, one of those is Val Ray. And we discuss this a lot, and this Bible verse always comes up. 
She's going to get to throw that wheelchair away pretty soon. I'm looking forward to that day. No more wheelchairs. She's going to be able to, what? Leap as a heart? We had a lot of deer up there in our place when we lived up in Washington State. And you'd watch them out there leaping and playing and cavorting together. It was amazing, but wow, wouldn't it be something to be able to jump like that? I mean, we had to put up an eight-foot fence around our garden area because they can go over a six-footer. And they love the stuff in the garden. So, leap like a heart. Val, you're probably out there watching this. Your turn's coming pretty soon. Won't that be something to hear the joyful voice of shouting? I can see, I can hear, I can walk and run. All the infirmities of old age will disappear forever and ever. That's a long time, ever and ever. And we will see only the bloom of eternal youth. Now, I was just reading in the Bible in chapter 90 of Psalms there, it talks about three score and ten is what we're allotted and possibly four score. How, how, how much is that four score? How much is that, Jim? You're pretty good at math. You, huh? <laughs> 80 years. Some of us are already there. Some of us are over that already. Uh, one of them speaking up here. But to have eternal youth, I'm looking forward to that. But it says, my time is short. I'm on borrowed time right now. You realize that, don't you? It's 81. It says it's four score, maybe. My mom lived to 102. Amazing. And she still played with a full deck. Amazing. <laughs> what a gal. So every mind will be keen and alert. 1 Corinthians 2.9, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither had entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that, what? Love him. Do you love Jesus? Oh boy, he's got some great things waiting for you and for me, doesn't he? Now to me that is a promise without parallel. There is nothing quite like it in all the Bible. When it says I have never seen anything to compare with heaven that is great enough because I have seen some wonderful things in this world in all my travels. I have a fertile imagination and I can imagine things that are out of this world, but still but the Bible says we won't even begin to approach the beauty and the glory of heaven. You know, we need to put our minds there once in a while, folks, and think about that. We're told to Think about the closing moments of Christ's life. But I think, too, we need to think of the future that he's preparing for us. You know, and share this with others. This all is going to end soon. One of the most pleasing aspects of that holy habitation is that it will be a clean city and a clean country. You mind if I go over a little bit? I got a few more things here. Revelation 21, verse 26, There shall be no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. Just think, no litter, no gum on those golden sidewalks, no cigarette butts, no empty beer bottles or soft drink cans littering the gutter. You know, I, I was in Okinawa for three years, and uh, when I was in the Air Force, and I really loved, we went to the beach every weekend. I wasn't a son of the Adventist at that time, but we loved going to the beach. But as I looked around on those beach, beautiful beaches, but as I looked around, there was empty plastic bottles, glass bottles, junk all over the place. That's not going to happen in the new heaven and the new earth. We're not going to have any of that. I'm looking forward to it. Our senses are stirred by the prospect of such physical benefits as the ones we reviewed here today. Yet the very highest pleasure reserved 
for the redeemed will have nothing to do with their lifestyle, their food, or their immortal nature. The sweetest delight of heaven will be to see Jesus face to face and to live with him throughout eternity. That's what it's really all about, isn't it? Our Redeemer. What a prospect to see the nail prints in his hands. He's going to be having that throughout eternity, those scars on his hands for you and for me. Those were put there. And for him to open our minds to his divine instruction in the science of salvation. Now the question I want to leave with you is this. When that day dawns and the saints of God march into that city, will you be among them? We can make a reservation now if we so desire. And I hope each one of you does. During World War II, a lot of Americans were caught in Singapore. And even though the American government provided a means of helping them, they had difficulty getting out because of the irregular changes of war. One day, a very fine, well-dressed man walked into the American embassy, and he said, book me out of here. I want to get out as quickly as possible. The ambassador said, all right, where's your passport? The man said, well, I don't have a passport. Aren't you a citizen? Well, no. I never, never did really take out any papers. But I've lived there all my life. I have a business over there. My bank account is there. And I love America. And I'm an American. The ambassador said, I'm sorry. But I can't do a thing for you. If you are not a citizen, I can't help you. That poor man went away sick with disappointment. A little while later, another man came walking in, dressed in old shabby clothes. He spoke with a very heavy accent as he asked to be booked on the next plane. The ambassador asked, where are your papers? The man replied, here they are. I had them taken out just before I left America. And the ambassador put on, out his hand and said, all the power of the United States government will stand behind you in getting you out to safety. Both of these men loved America very much. Both of them claimed to be Americans, but only one of them had his papers. Only one had his passport. Only one of them could make a reservation. And you can make reservations if you want to. But you must be a citizen of that heavenly kingdom before you can do it. Now is the time. If you want to do it, you can make your reservation now. When that day comes, you can join with God's people of all ages and dwell in this beautiful city under the ideal conditions which, we have, been, which have been described here today. If this is your desire, please stand with me now as we sing our closing hymn. Heavenly Father, may there not be one missing from our group here today when that day comes. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.